the doctrine of blood atonement existed in the LDS Church in the 19th century, which stated that the blood of Christ does not atone for eternal sins, such as murder, adultery, fornication, theft and apostasy. It required that the blood of the guilty be spilled upon the ground to receive forgiveness for these sins, usually by slitting the throat or decapitation, hence the capital punishment law that existed in Utah from 1851 to 1888 by which those convicted of murder could be executed by decapitation. The idea of spilling one's blood to atone for their sins started with Joseph Smith, the founder of the LDS Church and a strong believer in this type of capital punishment, especially the blood-for-blood blood requirement. An example of the blood-for-blood blood requirement is found in Genesis chapter 4 verse 10, which talks about that after Cain killed Abel, Abel's blood cried up to God from the ground, and a reference to blood atonement in the Bible is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 which says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Joseph Smith strongly agreed with such capital punishment and wanted to restore these doctrines of the Bible. They were thus included in the Book of Mormon various times including Alma chapter 1 verse 13, and 2 Nephi chapter 26 verse 3, in which the blood of murdered people cries out for justice. In a short speech by Joseph he said, I don't want the brethren to act unlawfully but I will tell them one thing. Judas was a traitor and instead of hanging himself, was hung by Peter. Joseph Smith also said that if he ever enacted the death penalty on someone, he would shoot him or cut off his head, spilling his blood on the ground, and let the smoke thereof ascend up to God. And if ever I have the privilege of making a law on that subject, I will have it so. Also, concerning adultery, Joseph Smith said, For those who break the new and everlasting covenant, or eternal marriage, they shall be destroyed in the flesh. Another example of this philosophy existing in Joseph Smith's time was a quote by Sidney Rigdon, who was a counselor in the first presidency under Joseph, who said, There are men standing in your midst that you can't do anything with them, but cut their throat and bury them. Also, John D. Lee, a prominent member of the church and a friend of Joseph Smith, said, I knew of many men being killed in Nauvoo, and I know of many a man who was quietly put out of the way by the orders of Joseph and his apostles while the church was there. After the death of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young solidified blood atonement as doctrine. In 1844, the same year that Joseph Smith was killed, it is said that Brigham Young approved the death of another Mormon by an unknown assassin in Nauvoo, Illinois. Young described the incident as a deed of charity, because he might now possibly be redeemed in the eternal world. In 1846, Brigham said that decapitation for repeated sinners is the law of God, and it shall be executed. Also in 1846, after leaving Nauvoo, Brigham Young threatened to cut the throats of some individuals who had stolen wagon parts when they get out of the settlements where his orders could be executed. Later that same year, Brigham ordered when a man is found to be a thief, cut his throat and throw him in the river. Brigham Young also added the oath of vengeance to the temple ritual in Nauvoo, in which church members promised to avenge the blood of the prophets on this nation, meaning that they promised to avenge the blood of Joseph Smith. This oath remained a part of the temple rituals until the 1920s. Another temple ritual started by Brigham Young was the Blood Oath, in which church members promised to not reveal the temple rituals to non-members. While taking this oath of secrecy, each member, while performing gestures, stated they would rather my throat be cut from ear to ear, and my tongue torn out by its roots, our breasts be torn open, our hearts and vitals torn out and given to the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. This graphic wording was removed in the 20th century and replaced with a reference to different ways a life may be taken. Then in 1990, the gestures and the penalties were removed, and the oath to simply never disclose the temple secrets remained. After moving the church to Salt Lake City, Utah, Young used the Council of Fifty as a legislative body, although its authority was limited under his presidency. In 1849, Young addressed the Council of Fifty about what to do with thieves, murderers and adulterers, and said, I want their cursed heads to be cut off that they may atone for their crimes. The next day the council voted that a jailed man had forfeited his head, and to dispose of him privately. Later that same month, Brigham Young wanted to decapitate the man along with a fellow prisoner, but the Council of Fifty decided to let them live. Then in 1851, the General Assembly of the State of Deseret, which was appointed by the Council of Fifty, adopted decapitation as a legal means of capital punishment, which was in force until 1888. Brigham Young also believed in applying the blood atonement to those who were guilty of miscegenation with black people. In 1852, while addressing the Utah legislature, he said that if a white Mormon in an unguarded moment should commit such a transgression, decapitation would do a great deal towards atoning for the sin. It would do them good that they might be saved with their brethren. It is the greatest blessing that could come to some men to shed their blood on the ground and let it come up before the Lord as an atonement. 
In 1856, Young reiterated what blood atonement is in simple terms. He said, It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit. There are sins that can be atoned for, by an offering upon an altar as in ancient days, and there are sins that the blood of a lamb, or a calf, or of turtle dove, cannot remit, but they must be atoned for by the blood of the man. Brigham Young also encouraged the members of the church to voluntarily carry out blood atonement. In a speech given by Young in March 16, 1856, he said that if you found your brother in bed with your wife, and put a javelin through both of them, you would be justified, and they would atone for their sins and be received into the kingdom of God. Under such circumstances, I have no wife whom I love so well that I would not put a javelin through her heart, and I would do it with clean hands. Young also taught that when a person violates a covenant with God, the blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. On another occasion Young and Jedediah Grant, his second counselor whose nickname was Brigham Sledgehammer, attended a meeting on September 21, 1856. Both men addressed blood atonement extensively in this meeting. Grant stated there were many church members who have committed sins that cannot be forgiven through baptism, and need to have their blood shed, for water will not do, their sins are too deep a die. Grant counseled these people to volunteer to have a committee appointed by the First Presidency to select a place and shed their blood. At the same meeting, Brigham Young said, there are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness, in this world or in that which is to come, and if they had their eyes open to see their true condition, they would be perfectly willing to have their blood spilt upon the ground that the smoke thereof might ascend to heaven as an offering for their sins, and the smoking incense would atone for their sins. Brigham claimed that some church members had already come to him and offered their blood to be forgiven of their sins. Young also said in that meeting that for certain sins the shedding of blood was the only condition for which they can obtain forgiveness, or to appease the wrath that is kindled against them, and that the law might have its course, and that the atonement of Christ was for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit, on February 8, 1857, Brigham Young said, Now take a person in this congregation, and suppose he is overtaken in a gross fault, that he has committed a sin that he knows will deprive him of that exaltation that he desires, and that he cannot attain to it without the shedding of his blood, and also knows that by having his blood shed he will atone for that sin and be saved and exalted with the gods. Is there a man or woman in this house but would say, Shed my blood that I may be saved and exalted with the gods? All mankind love themselves, and let these principles be known by an individual, and he would be glad to have his blood shed. That would be loving themselves, even unto an eternal exaltation. Will you let your brothers and sisters likewise, when they committed a sin that cannot be atoned for without the shedding of their blood, will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? That is what Jesus Christ meant. I could refer you to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. I have seen scores and hundreds of people for whom there would have been a chance if their lives had been taken, and their blood spilled on the ground as a smoking incense to the Almighty, but who are now angels to the devil. I have known a great many men who have left this church for whom there is no chance whatever for exaltation. But if their blood had been spilled, it would have been better for them. This is loving our neighbor as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. And if he wants salvation and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. If you have sinned a sin requiring the shedding of blood, except the sin unto death, he would not be satisfied nor rest until your blood should be spilled, that you might gain that salvation you desire. That is the way to love mankind. Brigham Young was not the only church leader at the time to support the blood atonement doctrine. As mentioned before, his second counselor, Jedediah Grant, supported Brigham's view of blood atonement. During a meeting at the Salt Lake Tabernacle, Grant said, I say what ought such a people do with covenant breakers? Why says one, forgive them to be sure. Very good, but what else ought they to do? What does the apostle say? He says they are worthy of death. Grant also said that it is the church's right to kill a sinner to save him when he commits those crimes that can only be atoned for by shedding his blood. We would not kill a man, of course, unless we killed him to save him. Another strong advocate for blood atonement was Parley Pratt, who was a member of the church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. In 1855, Pratt urged the Utah legislature to make death the penalty for fornication and adultery. He viewed 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 as a biblical reference for blood atonement. This verse in the Bible calls for a sinner to be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Pratt also said, This destruction of the flesh must have had reference to the death of the body, the man having justly forfeited his life in accordance with the law of God. One example of the blood atonement being carried out was given in the memoirs of John D. Lee, a prominent member of the church and a friend of both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He wrote about one incident of blood atonement being enforced. He said Rosmos Anderson was a Danish man who had come to Utah, 
He had married a widow lady, and she had a daughter that was fully grown at the time of the Reformation. At one of the meetings during the Reformation, Anderson and his stepdaughter confessed that they had committed adultery, believing when they did so that Brigham Young would allow them to marry when he learned the facts. Their confession being full, they were rebaptized and received into full membership. They were then placed under covenant that if they again committed adultery, Anderson should suffer death. Soon after this, a charge was laid against Anderson before the council, accusing him of adultery with his stepdaughter. The council voted that Anderson must die for violating his covenants. Clinton Smith went to Anderson and notified him that the orders were that he must die by having his throat cut, so that the running of his blood would atone for his sins. Anderson, being a firm believer in the doctrines and teachings of the Mormon Church, made no objections, but asked for half a day to prepare for death. His request was granted. His wife was ordered to prepare a suit of clean clothing, in which to have her husband buried, and was informed that he was to be killed for his sins, she being directed to tell those who should inquire after her husband, that he had gone to California. Clinton Smith, James Haslam, Daniel McFarland and John Higby dug a grave in the field near Cedar City, and that night, about twelve o'clock, went to Anderson's house and ordered him to make ready to obey the council. Anderson got up, dressed himself, bid his family goodbye, and without a word of remonstrance, accompanied those that he believed were carrying out the will of the Almighty God. They went to the place where the grave was prepared. Anderson knelt upon the side of the grave and prayed. Clinton Smith and his company then cut Anderson's throat from ear to ear, and held him so that his blood ran into the grave. As soon as he was dead, they dressed him in his clean clothes, threw him into the grave and buried him. They then carried his bloody clothing back to his family and gave them to his wife to wash, when she was again instructed to say that her husband was in California. She obeyed their orders. Anderson was killed just before the Mountain Meadows Massacre. The killing of Anderson was then considered a religious duty and a just act. It was justified by all the people, for they were bound by the same covenants, and the least word of objection to thus treating the man who had broken his covenant would have brought the same fate upon the person who was foolish as to raise his voice against any act committed by order of the church authorities. In 1958, Gustav Larson, professor of church history at the church's Brigham Young University, stated that blood atonement was indeed practiced by the church, and referenced an example of blood atonement being enforced. He said, To whatever extent the preaching on blood atonement may have influenced action, it would have been in relation to Mormon disciplinary action among its own members. In point would be a verbally reported case of a Mr. Johnson in Cedar City, who was found guilty of adultery with his stepdaughter by a bishop's court and sentenced to death for atonement of his sin. According to the report of reputable eyewitnesses, judgment was executed with consent of the offender who went to his unconsecrated grave in full confidence of salvation through the shedding of his blood. Such a case, however primitive, is understandable within the meaning of the doctrine and the emotional extremes of the Mormon Reformation. Another example of the doctrine of blood atonement existing in the church was given when John D. Lee was executed in 1877 for his role in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Lee was offered a choice of firing squad, hanging or decapitation for his execution. He chose firing squad instead of decapitation, because the choice of execution by firing squad sent a clear signal to the faithful that he rejected a spiritual need to atone for any sins. Then in 1888, decapitation was removed from Utah state law as an option for capital punishment. A year later, on December 12, 1889, the Presidency and Apostles of the Church publicly released a manifesto in an attempt to reconcile with the United States government and achieve statehood for Utah. The manifesto denounced the doctrine of blood atonement and said, This church views the shedding of human blood with the utmost abhorrence.